So great to be with you again, and I'm excited to be in the book of Ephesians. Um, if you're, you'd like to follow along a digital copy, or if you brought your Bibles, Ephesians 4, the middle of the chapter, beginning at verse 17, is where we're going to be. Um, sometimes uh, when we gather together, um, I've spent and sort of saturated my heart and mind all week in a particular passage, and I'm, I'm so excited to look at this uh, 15, 20 verses with you this morning. Um, I want to ask a question. What, what's new? What's new? Uh, wouldn't that be weird if I just, oh yeah, tell me. So what's new in your life? If I asked all of you to voluntarily answer that. Um, we are obsessed with what's new in our culture. Uh, we get excited about new things that are new and improved, uh, a new season of a show that we like, the birth of a new baby. Uh, we get excited about the beginning of a new year, even Scripture gets in to uh, our uh, f- excitement and joy in finding out what's new. Jesus talks about new wine, a new commandment, a new covenant. He was died and raised to newness of life for you and I. And the story of Scripture ends with a glorious grand vision. Behold, Jesus says, I am making all things new. Um, was anybody else a child of the 90s and wore Christian t-shirts other than me? Thank you. Thank you for your courage, for raising your hand. Uh, the the pre team meeting this morning of volunteers, a few of them had a lot of fun making fun of me. My first Christian t-shirt um, celebrated the newness that is ours in Christ. It had some sort of chameleon on the front and on the back. I was taught to memorize this verse, and it said, Behold, um, anyone who is in... Christ is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. I wore that t-shirt pretty frequently and I was taught in my own upbringing to know this idea that if you're in Christ, you're new. And I don't know if I just wasn't listening and it was talked about or if we actually didn't cover this, but here's the problem. That new birth didn't solve old habits. And there was this tremendous division in my own life between the newness that I had in Christ and yet the old patterns of life that were mine prior to knowing Christ. Even though I came to know him as a young age, uh, a friend of mine penned a lyric in a song. He said, the new has come, but the old is haunting me. And maybe my church talked about it. I don't remember it or else I wasn't listening very well. What do I do with this division in my own life, in my own self, between the new birth that is mine in Christ and the old self, the old nature that I still feel its desires and wants and longings. We're in a series in Ephesians looking at the death of our divisions. And Paul has been so communal in what he's proclaimed. He's helped the church at Ephesus, this group of Christians, to understand all of the riches that are theirs in Christ. And it's been pretty communal, pretty corporate in his view. And now he sort of zeroes in on a division that exists in our inner lives. And he puts in contrast the old self and the new self. And he acknowledges that in each and every one of us, there is a division between the new self and the old self. And what Christ wants to do is tear down that dividing wall so that you and I actually live a new life as new creatures. Ephesians 4 shows us a way to break down this division. What I want to talk about with you this morning and cover are three things, that there is a new self, there's a new birth We need to chat about that for a minute, even though it may seem kind of obvious if you followed Christ very long. But then there's not just a new birth, there's a new way of life that's available to us. And then the final thing, and really where the rubber meets the road, that I hope we have time to spend on is, well, how do I live that new way? How do I actually live into that new way and not just according to my old patterns? So let's first look at the fact that you and I have a new self, a new birth. Paul puts in contrast the old self and the new self. And before we get too far into this, I want us to connect with the heart of what Paul is saying about the new birth, the new self, which is that you and I, if you're a follower of Christ, are not like everyone else. Paul kind of radically says to this group of people in Ephesus, he says, look at this, you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. 
Paul uses strong language to tell them, the Christians in Ephesus, that you are not like everyone else. This is somewhat like me looking out to you and saying, you must no longer live as the North Texans live. You must no longer live as the Americans live. It's kind of an odd thing to say to a group of Gentiles in Ephesus to say, you must no longer live as as the Gentiles do. But wait, we are Gentiles by birth, Paul. Yeah, I know. Your new birth and identity in Christ transcends your culture. It transforms your tribalism. It transforms you as a person. It makes you into a new creature, a new birth, such that you are no longer just like everyone else. And Paul wants there to be a contrast because there's meant to be a contrast between God's people in the world and everyone else. He said your lives should look different. Why? Because you have a new birth. You're a new creature. And for those of you who have never yielded to the love of Christ, he begins to describe the kind of life that those outside of Christ um, experience. And it's really sort of six different layers. We won't look at all of them in great detail, but six different layers of, of corruption, of distortion, of futility. And when you zero down, what you find out is the real heart of the message that Paul is saying is that if you don't have Christ, for those who don't have Christ, there is a hardness of heart. There's a callousness to spiritual things, all the list sort of pushes you to that place to where the heart is sort of like a stone towards God and towards spiritual things. And we're darkened, he uses all this language, darkened understanding, futility of mind. Paul actually begins to use language that for our modern ears will understand, language of addiction. He says they have given themselves up or over to, and then he lists a few things. That's the language that in our modern day we would understand as addiction, as being in the grip of a master that has control over your lives. And Paul's trying to say to the Christians in Ephesus, what did he know about their lives? He must have really known things they were struggling with because he says, brothers and sisters, you, you get to live differently than that. You no longer have to be mastered by your appetites, but But at this point in time, they needed Paul to disrupt their their common lives and to say, you you have the opportunity to not be mastered by your appetites. For any of you who have ever come to know and had the humility to confess an addictive behavior in your life, you know what it's like to be desensitized, to be numb, to be calloused, it, it, it starts with needing a small dose, and then you need a little more. It could be, let me just, since we're thinking maybe, I don't know if you are, but I go to grand addictions. It could be something as uh, something like screen time, where what used to be 30 minutes to an hour is now six to seven hours. It, you can get a report on most of your smartphones Um, to see kind of where you're at in that trend to find out how much am I needing this little hit of dopamine throughout the day and how much it becomes a common practice. You start out small, but it gets worse and worse. And the nasty part of addiction is that it begins to master you. It begins to rule over you. I have found tremendous help in paying attention to how those who have journeyed through addiction that are Christians, draw parallels to the way sin works in our lives. In the AA book, it says that there was this idea that somehow, someday, I would control and enjoy drinking. This is the greatest obsession of every abnormal drinker, to think that someday you'll control it rather than it controlling you. This persistence, this illusion is astonishing, they write. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. This is what it's like to become calloused. And I want you to know that the Christian answer to sin and addiction is not try harder. Do better. That's not the answer. I hope hope that's good news. I, I grew up most of my Christian life thinking that what we had to do is we just really had to try harder, work harder, harder. 
And, and so you hear sermon and you read books and we sing songs that seem to imply that the way that I really make a change is I work harder. No, there is a new birth. For those who don't know Christ, there's a new birth, there's a new creature, there are new clothes that you put on. And it is a definitive action that happens, it occurs. Um, it doesn't happen all in a moment, but it occurs, it's real, the real change happens. It's not just about trying harder. There is a new self that comes through grace. This is what we've been looking at through the first part of Ephesians. It comes God's riches are yours at the expense and cost of the life of Christ. One of my favorite illustrations of that was Luther used to say that the wedding ring of faith that's put on you, all the riches of God are yours now. He called it passive righteousness. Um, I'm, I'm in a suit today. And a couple months back, we had a wedding to go to, and Tucker, my son, and I were dressed in... Uh, Casual North Texas attire. It's actually workout clothes, and everybody wears them everywhere now. Uh, we had actually exercised that morning. We were kind of a mess. We looked a little frumpy, but we were running errands, and we happened to go by, and I was like, this is the kind of formal wear suit store. Tucker, we need to run in here real quick and get, get our, the clothes for the wedding that's coming up. That's like pulling fingernails out of an 11-year-old child. Like, it's the worst news he could have had on this Saturday, but we had to do it. We walk in, and I was wearing workout clothes, flip-flops, and Tucker was wearing something like that. And I tried on the jacket first, and I put it on. I was, like, looking in the mirror, and Tucker was like, Dad, that looks terrible. Because I didn't put on, I didn't put on the whole suit. I put on a piece, and but I had my flip-flops on and my shorts on, and I said, you know, you're right. It's kind of hard to tell if it's going to work. Let me put on, let me put it all on. And I did. And when I put it all on, you know, I kind of started to have a little bit of a swagger. I stood differently in the mirror. Um, and just to try to get, you know, a little bit of joy and laughter out of my son, I walked like, I, you know, I had, I had something to say. I was clothed in new clothes. Um, the 11-year-old, on the other hand, I made him put on the suit and he still sort of looked like he was just, you know, he didn't change his posture. It didn't change his perception of himself. Paul wants us to know, Christ wants us to know, that something's really happened to you in Christ and you're a new creature. You're a beloved son or daughter. And that past action, if you've put your faith in him, is real. It's not just about modifying your behavior. There's a new power at work in your lives, and actually much of the New Testament talks about it as new clothing. You are now clothed in Christ. And what Paul wants us to see is, okay, well, I've got this new clothing. Why do I still want to sort of stand the same way and live the same way and be mastered by the same addictions? Paul wants us to know you can't do that. So this is the second thing. There's not just that there's a new birth. There's a new way of life for this new self that's available to you and to me. There's actually a new, there's a new way, a new walk available to us. He says, do not walk as the Gentiles do, but learn to walk in this new way. Learn to live into the clothing that is now yours by God's grace. There's a new way of life available to us. Put off the old self, put on the new self. He gives several practical examples. I'm thankful that I've got this week and next week. We're going to look at some of these practical examples because he gets into very specific things to demonstrate the way in which this new way of life ought to begin to pervade very simple, ordinary practices Monday through Sunday, every day of the week, every hour of the day. This new way of life should be embodied and lived into. And he gives some examples, just a few. He says, put away falsehood. And I touched on this last week. We are not a covenant, a community of niceness as the church. We speak truth to one another. We're not deceitful towards one another. And, and Paul specifically applies our truth speech to the church. And he says, for your members of the same body, 
And so you speak truth to each other. We don't live under a covenant of niceness where I pretend that you're fine and you pretend that I'm fine and we just sort of avoid the hard conversations. No, we really, the iron sharpens iron image that we have of what the community of Christ is. We need one another to walk in this newness of life. He said, put away falsehood, be angry and do not sin, do not steal. Even even those, I have a, a close brother in Christ that many of the men that I know that have shared their lives with me will share certain struggles, and I'll share mine with them. Uh, his is one that I hadn't come across as often. Did you know that he grew up really poor and grew up stealing? And when he walks into a store, even though he's an ordained minister, he is tempted to live a life of stealing, and he struggles with it. So one of the things that we'll often talk about is that. How's that going And Paul says that this new way of life is so transformative that the one who was prone to steal, not he doesn't steal any longer, he he or she works and now lives out this new ethic of giving and sharing with others what they have. Because there's a new way of life for the new person, the new self. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, he says, but only such as for the good and building up of others. Does that describe your speech? The, the kind of talk that comes out of my, my mouth uh, on a regular basis, and, and if certainly this applies to your engagement in online platforms. Are you, the church, are you as a follower of Christ, marked by speech that is gracious and, build, and builds others up? And if not, Paul's saying, that's one of those areas where Christ wants to show you a new pattern, a new way of life. It's interesting how we'll go through this experience of being made new, and yet we look at the parts of our life that are kind of old, and they become so much a part of our way of being that sometimes we just accept them to be normative. They Almost like they're part of me. Well, that's just me. I'm just a little fill-in-the-blank, and everybody knows that. And Lewis wrote a text that is not, is not really well read about people's journey from sort of hell creatures, ghost-like creatures that we all are, he argues, to being heavenly creatures. And there's one particular metaphor that I want to lean on. He tells the story of a man in the book, The Great Divorce, that is one of these creatures that's being invited to be transformed. And the man has um, just, you know, it's fantasy, it's Lewis. You just bear with me, Okay. He has a a demonic sort of lizard-like creature that sits on one shoulder. And um, the man has become so accustomed to this other thing being in his life that he's not quite sure if he wants the angel or God to deal with it because he's become so comfortable with it in his life. And on one occasion, uh, the man actually is invited by an angelic creature to kill this thing that's been torturing him and plaguing him, and he says, you know, maybe you don't have to kill it. Maybe you don't have to get rid of it entirely. Can't, can't we just do this another time? And the angel says, in this moment are all moments. Either you want this creature gone, or you do not. And the lizard, recognizing the hesitation of the young man, begins to mock and plead with him. He says, be careful, the angel can do what he says. He can kill me. One fatal word from you and he will, and then you'll be without me forever and ever. And he goes on to try to convince him, you won't really be yourself without me. I know there are real pleasures, the creature says to the man. I know there are no real pleasures, only dreams, but aren't they better than nothing? I'll be good, I admit it. I've gone too far in the past. I promise I won't do it again. There's this sense in which the man begins to realize that the angel intends to kill it, but to kill it means that something has to be put to death. The angel begins to glow with the fiery glow, and the man gets really nervous because he realizes that there might be some pain associated with this transformation into a new way. He finally accepts the angel's offer and agrees to let the angel do his work. And an amazing thing happens that really we have to look to people like Lewis to daydream and uh, think about. What happens is that the lizard falls to the ground and dies, but it comes back to life as a heavenly stallion. 
And the man turns from a ghost to a real man and sets atop this heavenly stallion and begins to master that which had mastered him. Do you, you, you track in with Lewis? I know it's kind of a long story. The very thing that he was mastered by that was abusing him, the addiction in his life, he is now put to death and then transformed. And now it's in its appropriate place where he has the joy of mastering it. Lewis's own words are better than mine. He says, when it hits the ground, it becomes a stallion and the young man gets on it and rides. What had been the ruler is now ruled. What had been his master, he now masters. What had ridden him, he now rides. There is a new way of life available to you as a new creature in Christ And if you will invite and participate with him putting to death the old self, what you'll find is that the joy and pleasure that you're after in the old self will be rightly channeled. And you'll actually experience what it could never promise. Secular surveys. Secular surveys of sexuality in our society continue to tell us the story that a monogamous, faithful marriage brings greater sexual fulfillment than a life of promiscuity. And our culture knows nothing of it. It's not the story that's being told, but it's a fact. How can that be? Because God is saying that if you'll rightly order desires, if you'll rightly order desires, you'll be in a position of experiencing real joy and fulfillment rather than being mastered by the addiction. Okay, something has to die. The Puritans, the early Christians knew this. They called it mortification. Something had to be put to death. And we begin to struggle with, but wait a minute, my old self is gone. Yeah, but there's a a daily practice that has to be observed to put to death whatever belongs to the old nature and to put on what belongs to the new nature. Now, this is the third and final thing, and I'm gonna call it a new motivation because I hope that by making it that simple, it's it's digestible for all of us that how, how do you close the gap between the old self and the new self? Some of you might say, I've done what you just said in that little story, and yet I can, so how do I close the gap? I still feel the division in my own life between the old self and the new self. How do I close the gap? I want to contend, most importantly, you now have a new motivation for your life that's radically different than what you've heard from religion and what you've heard in this culture. Okay, but I want to say three things. Two, you're expecting me to say one, you're not. The first two are this. One is, in fact, yes, indeed, you need new habits. I was reading because it was assigned to me in graduate school, a book by Augustine called The Confessions. And depending upon the translation that you pick up off the shelf, it can be really difficult to read. So if you're interested, ask me. I've got a particular translation that's actually accessible and easy to read. And it was the first time that I had heard a Christian be so honest about sin. After conversion, after being made a churchman, a a, a clergyman, after ordination, it's in book eight, Augustine begins to be really honest about the ongoing struggle with sin that he experiences. And he begins to realize that the only way real change is going to happen is I'm going to have to develop new holy habits. I'm going to have to throw the other stuff overboard, but I've got to develop new holy habits. There are many. Here's one. He begins to speak about sin in the present tense. And he gives to us... um, uh, edification as his brothers and sisters in Christ 2,000 years later to realize that the beauty of being a Christian is that you no longer have to pose and act like sin isn't a struggle for you. Do you get that in Paul in Ephesians 4? Absolutely. Paul's telling these people in Ephesians, hey, you're new and I want you to learn to live a new life. What does that tell you and me? You're not alone in your struggle with sin. It's the experience of every single person who wants to follow Christ You're going to have to develop new habits, and one of those is, and we get to practice it when we gather every week. We encourage each other to practice it, but it's something we encourage in our spirituality to do every day, even multiple times a day, is to confess sin before God in the present tense. What what do I mean present tense? I mean most of the time in churches we get grand stories about, you know, I want to give a testimony to something that happened 10 years ago. (laughs) 
And here's what I struggled with, past tense, but here's how everything is all rainbows and unicorns now. And what Christ, what Paul, what Augustine, what the early church knew is that that is not sincere Christian spirituality because sincere Christian spirituality is confessing sin in the present tense. You have to do that in ways that are appropriate in the context. Uh, You need people that you're doing with that are real people in your life where you are sharing present tense struggle, not just sort of generic broad things, but specific present tense struggles. Secondly, you need a new community. Um, I believe that the stat is somewhere around 80% of people who claim to be Christians in North America today believe that you can be a faithful follower of Christ and have no real connection to a body of believers. Christ, the New Testament, the early church knows nothing of that kind of individual spirituality. You need a new community. One that is helping you discover ultimately what I wanted to say here, which is this new motivation. Why am I now motivated to live a different life? This is the most important thing I have to say today, and then I'll finish. Why, would I, why am I motivated to live differently? It's not just because I want to be a better person. I hope it's not because you're motivated by fear or pride Right, there's sort of a culturally, socially accepted way to behave, and I want to I adhere to that cultural, social acceptance. So I'm going to be motivated by fear or pride to do that. No, it's not that. What's the motivation for those of us that are new in Christ? We get to look at this next week and a little bit today. You and I are beloved sons and daughters. And Paul ends this very practical section by saying at the beginning of chapter 5, verse 1, be imitators of God as dearly beloved children. You know when things begin to really change in my inner life is when I stop performing out of fear or pride and I began reminding myself on a daily basis that I am his son and that I am loved. The Compline prayer at the end of every evening in our prayer book says, keep me as the apple of your eye. Um, It's said twice every single night, and it's a way of reminding ourselves that we are children of God, and this becomes the motivation to live a new way. I already have a new birth. Christ, all the riches of God are mine in Christ. He wants me to live out a new life. How does that happen? By living in my identity as a child of God. That's the motivation, not behavior modification, not because I want to be accepted by my religious community, but because I'm a child of God, I I have a new adoption. I don't just want to be better, I'm new. Be imitators of God, he says. I love that Jesus is willing to be so provocative in his language. New food, new drink. As we come to the table, Christ is pointing us to himself to say, the food that really satisfies, the drink that really quenches is him. Paul actually said in this little moment, surely you've heard of him. You see, our hope is not in an idea, it's in a person who gave himself up on the cross so that you and I could be deeply joyed, joy-filled, deeply satisfied. And so as we come to the table, would you invite God, as we confess here in a moment, would you invite God to transform you at the level of desire where you want this drink and this food more than anything else in your life? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that because of your grace, we can be made new, and by your grace, we are transformed into that newness. I pray, Lord, that you would save us from um, mere religion, mere performance of trying to adhere to some outside standard for the sake of being accepted by others, but that you would work in our hearts a realization of who you've made us to be in Christ, that we would know that we're sons and daughters of you, the Most High. Father, we give you thanks for your goodness and for your grace, that you meet us in our brokenness here and now in the present tense, and that you meet us when we confess our sins. Would you do that now in Christ's name? Amen.